Hello everyone and welcome to the Movie Change-Up Black Widow Spoiler Review. Uh, I think this is kind of our first... But no, we did do a uh, Justice League uh, review, but I think this is our first ever theatrically released review. I don't think the Snyder Cut of Justice League was ever uh, released in theaters, so this is, I think, our first... Uh, not yet, Joe, not yet. And it never should be. Uh, my name is Joe Fricky, and of course I'm joined with my normal... Uh, Disney Plus review partner Tristan Mayer. Uh, we always do our, you know, Disney Plus reviews. And today we are reviewing the uh, Disney Plus slash theatrically released movie Black Widow. Uh, some may say, say it was re released a few years too late, but um, I enjoyed it. I saw it this morning and Tristan just got out of his theater about an hour ago. Uh, Tristan, what were kind of your thoughts going into it? Any kind of expectations? Going into it, of course, you have a level of expectations because it's our first MCU movie back since... Well, we had Spider-Man, but this is like a proper Marvel Studios-produced MCU movie, and it's been so long since you had that. So even though in my head I knew, okay, it's a Black Widow movie, it's kind of a spinoff, it's kind of grounded, it's not really going to be the big cosmic thing that the Marvel movies are kind of moving into right now, I was still really excited for it. and. I had a journey throughout the movie. I won't get into too much of my thoughts, but yeah, going into it, I I was looking forward to it, it returned to Marvel, but at the same time, it didn't seem like something that would be a mind blower, but it had potential to be like a Falcon of the Winter Soldier, Civil War, Winter Soldier kind of spy thriller within the MCU kind of vibe. So I was ready to give it that, that possibility too. Yeah, exactly. I was expecting kind of a smaller localized story, and I think that's kind of ended, what it ended up being for the most part. It wasn't some globe-spanning, you know, big event type thing, end of the world type situation. Like it potentially could have uh, went into that, but yeah, this movie was directed by Kate Shortland. Uh, she's direct. She hasn't really directed anything big. This is kind of her first uh, big thing that she's done. Obviously starred Scarlett Johansson, who's played Black Widow since Iron Man 2, so it's been a long time coming for her to get her first uh, and really only solo movie in the MCU. And I'll say I, you know, like Tristan, I expected a little, maybe a little something smaller. Uh, I really enjoyed it. It wasn't mind-blowing. I was talking to Tristan off-air uh, before he saw it that I thought it was kind of an upper upper middle as far as the mcu goes it wasn't mind-blowing you know i'll probably watch it again when it gets on uh when it's fully free on disney plus i'm not a type of person to go see a movie like over and over and over in the theater so when it hits free on disney plus i'll be like oh perfect i'll check it out again but yeah we can definitely dive a little bit deeper into our thoughts and kind of go over various elements in the movie uh tristan you want to start with that or do you have any yeah go over my thoughts i just wanted to give yeah. my preamble before we started but to give a couple of thoughts on the movie uh i was very into the first act especially i thought the flashback was really effective you had these two sibling uh daughters and you knew of course through the context of the movie that these are going to be scarlett yeah. johansson's yeah. uh black widow and then obviously Florence Pugh's character so you got like this almost in the style of like the americans you got like this family living under the radar in america and they're trying to sort of sell themselves as an American family, but in reality, there's this organized spy for this Russian. Of course, it's not like necessarily the communist government this time. It's like a larger scale Marvel level threat. But I like the beginning of this. I really thought the opening credits were effective too. They had that cover of Nirvana over them. And I was yeah. really like, oh, this is going to be some kind of grungy, like dark kind of take on a Marvel movie. It could really be that grounded spy thriller they keep telling us going to give us and not an another action movie and then of course it did kind of become another action movie <laughs> yeah. i was ultimately let down a bit by the movie it's not one i'm gonna probably revisit when it's on disney plus but it will be one of course i'll throw into the rewatch when i do a marvel rewatch someday in, in the future up and i'll put it where it belongs in the timeline i'm sure i'm gonna move it towards civil war and i think we'll get into more but i think this movie would have been a lot more effective if it came out when it originally seemed like it was supposed to <laughs> yeah and as far as like the opening flashback scenes, so we have the young. One thing I will say that was confusing about this movie is you had the Florence Pugh's character of Yelena, and then her like mother, supposedly in the movie Melina, 
especially with those like fake Russian accents, it was very hard to keep track of which one was which. <laughs> I even had to go on IMDb just now to remember which one was Yelena and which one was Melina. Probably in the script could have gone with different names, but one thing I was going to touch on, we had the young uh, Yelena, played by Violet McGraw, who, if you're a Haunting, a, uh, Haunting of Hill House fan, uh, you'll recognize him there. And then, as young Natasha, we had Ever Anderson, and do you have any idea who Ever Anderson is or who what her connection is? Not at all. I recognize the Violet McGraw of Hill House fame, but I did not at all recognize Ever Anderson. I don't know who that is at all. Ever Anderson? You probably won't recognize her name, but you'll recognize her parents' names. Her parents are Mila Jovovich and Paul W.S. Anderson. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, <laughs> she, she's probably going to be in a number of things after after this. Yeah, I'm curious if she'll be in the next Resident Evil, you know, the, she was the daughter in, of... She was, she's, uh, I, looking at her IMDb, she has been in a Resident Evil movie. I didn't look to see what her role was, if she's mes- necessarily a younger Mila Jovovich in a flashback or uh, played her daughter. Oh, yeah, she was, uh, she played her, like, the younger version of her mother in Resident Evil, the final chapter from 2016. So there we go. But uh, back to Yeah, I looked t- it up right now. She's got two credits. You know, she also played Wendy in the Peter Pan and Wendy, whatever that is. Yeah, probably a pilot that never went anywhere. But uh I I will say I like this opening scene. I did think to an extent maybe it was a little too long. I don't know if we necessarily needed it to be like the five, ten minutes, whatever it was. I feel like they could have got to it faster, got to the point where I'm like, okay, is this going to be a recurring thing in this movie of these, like the younger versions of them? But it moved along. We got a cool action scene of them flying away uh, in the beginning. And then kind of we had a cool, like you were talking about, the montage with the cover of the Nirvana song, which I still to this moment don't know if I really loved or really hated. It was... It, I, I, as it was playing i was just like i don't know if i really like this or really don't and right now i can't even tell you what my thoughts were on that cover the montage itself i liked because uh, it did it kind of gave me like a born feel or something like that which definitely was mm-hmm. it, what it was playing into uh but the cover itself i still don't know what my thoughts are on that uh but then, you know, further on, we delve and we see uh, Natasha. She's kind of just ha- hanging out in Europe, uh, hopping around, watching Bond movies. Uh, being the I once say, will say her, like, contact that she had that, like, had a bunch of people. I'm curious if he's going to play a larger part in the MCU moving forward, especially when we have, like, the Hawkeye show popping up. Is he going to mm-hmm. maybe pop into that and some of these other... Uh, movies and shows that I feel like will be grounded because I can't partially feel like the MCU is going to split into two things. We're going to have more of the space and ethereal kind of direction, and then we're also going to have more of the grounded uh, direction. So I wonder if he's going to play a part in that. Yeah, I think that's a good theory because we obviously are going to get more of the characters in this movie, whether it's obviously Florence Pugh's very obviously set up to be coming back to the Hawkeye show. She's yeah. going to be... It seems like a major yeah. antagonist or supporting character throughout yeah, that, that show. That, that was my theory. Is I think watching that, she's going to be the antagonist in this and uh, the Hawkeye show, or at least one of the antagonists, if not the if not the main one. So you do wonder if a few of these characters. I could I could see her guy. You mentioned like the British guy that she lived with for a while, who's like her contact that gives her all the planes and that kind of stuff. I could see him showing up on the Hawkeye show for a couple episodes. Like, oh, I know a guy who can get us a plane. We'll call him, and <laughs> he shows yeah. up for his episode and. Yeah. That could be a fun way to kind of keep these two connected and make it feel like one shared storyline. The all of these kind of like spy thriller angle of the MCU feels kind of connected to each other. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so we have her hopping around on Western Europe until one day a she basically gets some mail that she doesn't open, and then she's driving around in her car and she gets attacked by the Taskmaster, which I thought was a cool you know, fun scene, their, like, little mini battle. And, you know, this is after uh, Florence Pugh's character basically snaps free with her little antidote. How do you, how do you feel about her, like, little snap free moment and finding out she was kind of under, you know, mind control? I was a bit let down, honestly, because I was like, oh, more mind control. I think mind control is, like, the laziest form of storytelling. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, like, it's just a means of getting the characters to do things that, you know, I wasn't too put off by it and, ultimately it was more about like 
getting those two characters together. So I was pretty happy that Florence Pugh got out of the mind control like immediately <laughs> yeah. and wasn't all oh, a bad guy for the first half of the first three fourths of the movie to the end. Yeah. I was I was scared we get a Winter Soldier type thing where she's the bad guy throughout and then at the last scene she turns and I didn't, I'm glad that she was snapped out immediately. Yeah, I thought uh, Florence Pugh's character was going to be more of what the Taskmaster role was. Mm-hmm. Um, of kind of like this... Uh, basically, I thought Taskmaster was going to be what Ray Winstone's character was, and I thought uh, Florence Pugh's character was going to be more what Taskmaster was, where potentially like they're fighting, fighting, fighting throughout the movie, and then at the end they team up against Taskmaster, but... That's ultimately not exactly what it was. There was there they had their little fight and they had their skirmishes throughout the movie, but for the most part, when they were together, they were on the same side. Yeah, I really enjoyed the family aspects of this. I don't know how much you want to go like plot for plot like you've been doing, or just give thoughts. <laughs> I, I've just know? more been going trying to remember the movie and then explaining as I remembered. Because I definitely want to comment on the family elements of yeah. it as we get everybody kind of together. Like David Harbour's character, I thought yeah. was a really good addition to the cast i thought he's going to be a fun character to hopefully come back for more movies yeah i'm surprised there weren't a lot i expected more people to die like i fully expected the dad and the mom to potentially sacrifice themselves but they they're alive so they could pop up again i you know could see them being in the hawkeye show as well as you know maybe antagonist maybe the three of them the you know david harbour's character rachel vice's character and florence pugh's character are antagonists in the hawkeye show and then by the end, they team up and uh, help Hawkeye and uh, Kate Bishop's character against whoever maybe a larger villain is. Because I, I can't see them after this movie being like, oh yeah, Florence Pugh's like the big bad guy against Hawkeye. I feel like <laughs> they definitely could be like two episodes where they fight against each other and then they team up again. Yeah, I think that's probably what it'll go for. I really liked Florence Pugh's character in this. So yeah. I think she had a good dynamic against Scarlett Johansson. I almost feel like Florence Pugh has a performance outshine Scarlett Johansson a bit. I feel like Scarlett Johansson wasn't doing a ton in this movie in terms of like emoting and getting us engaged in the characters. She was just kind of giving her typical performance yeah. of Black Widow, you know, and I think Florence Pugh had a bigger role to fill because as an audience we knew that she was kind of there to sell to us as a new Black Widow. Like, this is gonna be our a pretty major character going forward. Yeah. So we have a lot of investment in watching this character be good or bad. And I was glad that she was so good in the role i think she's gonna fit well within the avengers especially that spy thriller side of it yeah. her and like sharon carter and the new captain america and bucky are all gonna be kind of side by side and hawk the Haley or the new hawkeye i think would be a really a uh, cool new dynamic of a team so i'm excited to see more from her and i thought she was yeah. great in the movie yeah i will say i uh like the uh I've been saying, like, for the past couple years when it was announced, like, that Florence Pugh was going to be a big part in the movie, and then when the trailer seemed to drop, like, two years ago, I was like, I think five years removed from this movie, we're not going to look at the Black Widow movie as, like, a goodbye to Scarlett Johansson, but a hello to Florence Pugh's character, and, like, walking midway through the movie, that's how I felt. Mm -hmm. This felt more like a Florence Pugh movie than a Scarlett Johansson movie. Yeah, it felt like a passing of the torch kind of movie where it's like, oh, Scarlett Johansson had her time as a spotlight of this huge, great character, and now she's handing it off to Florence Pugh for the future generation. And as we see more and more new characters come and old characters leave, it feels like that's what this phase of MCU might be, like a transitional phase from the old yeah. into the new and what who our new characters are going to be. All right. And then one thing I did want to ask is, uh, did you have a favorite scene in the movie or like a favorite moment or a favorite sequence? I think all the best scenes were the characters that are interacting with each other. I think uh, when they were all together, that first kind of family dinner when they were as adults, like they kind of had that first reunion and they shine, they had this conversation where to Florence Pugh's character, these, this is a real experience and this was something that she believed in and the rest of the family kind of saw through it and kind of knew that it wasn't real. But you also know, of course, like these people did care about each other. You can tell that David Harbour's character in a way did care yeah. about his daughters and cared about his wife and the wife of course cared about her daughters i think and it was a very complex and interesting dynamic of that family i also loved the comedy scene of florence making fun of black widow's oh, yeah, kind of hero was... jump <laughs> yeah, that hero was... landing you know that was a good running joke throughout uh i will say for me my favorite moment i think was everything in the prison 
with David Harbour's character of him like talking bragging about being the Red Guardian and them kind of everyone else kind of mocking him for it and part of me was wondering like if he has all of these if he basically has Captain America's powers why is he staying in this prison why isn't he busted out and then when you see like the further area around the prison and you're like okay he's surrounded by all these mountains and he's probably like hundreds of miles from any from any type of civilization there's he's Mm -hmm. like he could break out but he's gonna die if he tries to go anywhere so he basically is forced to stay in that prison and i like the arm wrestling sequence and just his whole personality and how he's changed because in the not the flashback but in the opening scene you can tell he's like kind of the serious guy who wants to get back into the fight and then Mm -hmm. by the time we catch up to him in 2016 he's just like this weird like goofy comedic guy who's starting to go a little crazy and you know it reminded me someone someone basically said that this movie is essentially the incredibles wrapped in the skin of the americans and it's it's basically like yeah that's what it is that's a really good uh interpretation of it (laughs) it definitely has that vibe to it i love the undercover spy aspects and i really wish that this would have come out back in the timeline of where it fit because i think it post civil war we would have this would have been a great movie because i always wonder between these big events like what is it like to be a superhero on the ground and when the avengers are broken up and what is it like i I think that could could have been a really strong fit i think this is kind of a a bad spot for it and i want to talk a bit about that release and a little bit about why it was held off and yeah why why you think they didn't just drop it on disney plus for 30 bucks a year ago yeah, I'm curious what... So this would have been basically the first movie before Infinity War, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm just looking at the release order of what everything was. So we had Thor Ragnarok, then Black Panther, then Avengers Infinity War. So I basically think... So, I mean, it could have dropped anywhere between Civil War and Infinity War, right? Essentially. Yeah. So it could have dropped... It would have been around the time of... Doctor Strange, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Spider-Man Homecoming, Thor Ragnarok, and Black Panther. Anywhere in there, and it would have been, you know, fine. I feel like we could have pushed everything back and thrown that movie in there, and it would have been fine. I feel like, for me, the re- the main reason they didn't just drop it on Disney Plus is somewhat for, like, the visual of it, of, hey, this is our second female-led superhero, superhero movie, and regardless of the fact of a pandemic and everything going on i feel like the optics of just hey we're gonna drop it on disney plus aren't great and i feel like disney would have got a lot of backlash for it and so that's probably why they're holding off and i think they also probably had the foresight that i'm kind of seeing now is people are still hesitant to go back to the theater and i feel like they wanted a big time release as disney's kind of first of the big budget movies to drop in the theater to hopefully draw people back to get people back to going to the theater again and i think they were hoping black widow would be that movie yeah it's an interesting choice i think it'll be something people look back on and debate as we get like years away from this last two years like what was the right move you know like was holding stuff off and putting it on streaming a good move because it doesn't seem like it paid off for hbo or for yeah. disney really you know so yeah hbo it seems already... like going back on some of their bigger movies like they said oh all of the movies of all of warner brothers movies of 2021 will be put for free on hbo max and they've already been like well except for dune and now except for this movie and except for that movie that they had said before would be there so so clearly that wasn't the move but then waiting you know you're shelve these movies for like two three years and then you just keep building this backlog of movies so i think it's just one of those ones that i think it's kind of dependent on the movie rather than this whole move itself was the right move or this whole move itself was the wrong move. Yeah, I think it'll be, especially as they build up the MCU, it's been fascinating in hindsight to look back because I want to mention the post credit scene as we get to it, but that's a whole thing that was totally out of order. Like, that's a character that showed up in the post credit scene, if you didn't know, it was Julie Louis-Dreyfus' char- uh, character who was also yeah. in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And... By the original release site plans, this movie would have been out would have been out before Falcon yeah. and the Winter Soldier. Yeah. So we kind of got this reverse introduction where a character we see in the TV shows now shows up in the movies, and it really made it feel like, all right, now back to the other stuff. Like it's like, yeah. oh, we had all these Disney Plus shows going after people really liking them. Let's take a break, watch this Black Widow movie, and yeah. then go right back to the Disney Plus shows. Yeah. 
Yeah, I will say it was the whole credits thing was weird because normally Marvel movies, the movie goes and it ends, and then you have kind of like these stylized credits with you know effects and whatnot, and then it goes to the first post credit <laughs> scene, and then you have the normal boring credits, and maybe one time in there it'll stop and they'll have another cre- post credit scene, and then one final one at the end. This one. It had, like, what felt like a post-credit scene at the very end of the movie where Natasha basically gets the cool plane from that her one, her contact friend. And it's like, oh, I'm going to try to bust uh, some of the Avengers (coughs) out of prison. And then it goes to, like, non-stylized, boring black and white credits. And then you had one at the end, and I just thought that felt weird. So I'm curious, was there originally going to be, like, a post credit scene for Falcon and Winter Soldier? But now that that's, you know, not, um, you know, that show's done, so you can't really have a post credit scene for that anymore. And, like, why you'd think they would have one for, like, one of the upcoming Marvel movies, but they might not have planned for... Um, this to be released so close to what shang chi and the legend of the mm-hmm. ten rings so they didn't have a post-credit scene filmed for uh black widow so that's why it wasn't there so i'm cu- I- i'm very curious if one day we'll find out that there was supposed to be another one but it was for like wandavision or loki or falcon and winter soldier and then obviously those were all released before black widow could even come out so that's why there wasn't one I wonder if that is true because I did hear back in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier times that there was a post credit scene for that show that involved uh, one of the characters from Black Widow. I can't remember which one it was. I think it was Galena, uh, her showing up and recruiting Zemo to be part of her kind of gang to take on what yeah, would have I think been Hawkeye. I, and... I think I did hear that as well, so that makes sense that that's why that it wasn't in... Um... You know, that's why that wasn't the post credit scene. And part of me thought, oh, so they probably pulled that from Falcon and then just moved it to Black Widow, and that's going to be, like, our post credit scene. And I wonder, I, I, if I was Marvel, maybe that's what I would have done. Like, you have this scene in the graveyard setting up what's going to happen with uh, the Hyd- Madame Hydra in that storyline, mm-hmm. and maybe your second scene is the Zemo cameo, but I, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe there's some hidden post credit scenes out there. I'm sure there's yeah. at least the Zemo ones out there in the in the, yeah. in the wild somewhere. Yeah. Or maybe, um, yeah, maybe this was supposed to, maybe what we just saw was supposed to be a post credit scene for one of the Falcon and Winter Soldier episodes or something. Mm hmm. Um, but one thing I will say, uh, to go back out. <laughs> unless you have something else you want to say about the credits one thing i did want to talk about was the whole natasha's mom storyline and well i guess this does tie into post credits because one of the things that they were talking about was natasha wanting to know about her real mom uh this whole you know the whole uh with that storyline once you kind of found out that that family wasn't her real family and you didn't really find anything else out about her one of the things, I'm not saying they should have done this, but I think it could have been interesting and then proved why this movie had to be when it was, is a post credit scene of after Natasha's death when she goes into, because well, it was this, what was the stone she had to return? was the soul, soul stone, right? I think so. And we saw there was a deleted scene where Tony talks to an adult Morgan when he snaps because he's ex- like exposed to the soul stone. And uh, someone else talks to someone in the afterlife too when they interact with the Soul Stone. I don't remember what it is, uh, but I think it would have been cool if the post credit scene was Natasha is dead and you're basically cut to after Infinity War and she's like in that pool talking to her birth mom, and that's the post credit scene to wrap that kind of mini storyline of her figuring out who her mom was. I would have liked that because I did think that storyline went nowhere. I was interested to see it like. Is this going to change some way she sees herself? Is this going to be a reveal of some character we don't know? Or is it just going to be like, oh, I don't need to know who my parents are. I'm good to be who I am and that kind of a plot line. But then it is kind of, oh, it's not your family. And and then they're gone. And that's it. This kind of got dropped. Yeah, because I was like, are they going to reveal that um, Rachel Weisz's character is actually her real birth mom or Mm -hmm. Florence Pugh? Like, I thought that might be the direction that they were going is that she is actually one of their real birth moms and maybe nobody knew. Uh, but then, yeah, that just didn't really pan out, and I was kind of confused, and I was really, ho- I'm glad they didn't go with what the direction I thought they were going, of basically her being like, oh, I don't care about my birth mom, because I have my, you know, like, 
uh, Rachel Weiss's character is my real mom. And I'm not saying mm-hmm. for anyone that's like not adopted, like your adoptive mom isn't your like real mom or whatever. But in her specific situation of like being abducted and all that, I feel like that'd be kind of like a tone deaf direction to go. Mm-hmm. I do. F- I want to move on a little bit to some negatives too. Been kind yeah. of positive about this yeah. one so yeah, far. And, and, <laughs> oh, can I say one thing? Cause I told you off air that there was something I saw that I think could be an interesting <laughs> show. And for me, it would be like the black widows the, like that group of black widows going around the world mm-hmm. like trying to rescue and like on mind control other black widows around the world because they kind of reminded me of like the Dora Milaje from uh black panther or padme's mm-hmm. handmaidens in star wars so i think that could be like an interesting fun show on disney plus is like them going around you kind of like quote unquote fake recast get like a more famous star to be be kind of the lead uh, and be like, oh yeah, this famous person was there the whole time. You know, they they were in mm-hmm. they were in Black Widow. They were just in the background. You didn't really notice them. But, yeah, you didn't see them. But yeah. Anyway, so yeah, let's get to your negatives. Yeah, I wanted to mention on your theory for that as a good show. I think that would be a good show. And I almost would wonder if uh, Yelena's appearance in Hawkeye could be like a pilot for her her own show. Maybe yeah. she'll be the one leading this Black Widow army, and we'll get like a Black Widow uh spy thriller kind of going across the globe and finding all these other widows like you said it could be a fun kind of adventure almost like this movie is you're going from place to place <laughs> yeah. and seeing all these different kind of yeah. yeah so let's move on to some negatives joe i i don't want to be all negative so i did we mentioned some positives up front and i liked a lot of the character stuff one thing that i did like here was one last thing to mention is this conversation that happened between between Yelena and Natasha, where Yelena tells her essentially like you're the killer who gets to be on the magazine covers and gets to be kind of like the famous celebrity that people look up to, and I'm like the real killer who has to live on, live on with my actions, live on my consequences, and do this to survive, not mm-hmm. just for like show as an Avenger. And I do think that was an interesting potential of like what is the division between Natasha and the rest of her family? She's an Avenger, meanwhile they're living her yeah, off of the grid you know they're not at all heroes like her and that does lead on to my negatives is i feel like this movie never figures out what it is like for for one scene it'll be a boring identity thriller with like really tight knit action where if black widow gets punched once or twice by the bad guy she's going to be in pain and then in the next scene she's falling off a building and smashing her head into the wall and bouncing down on these metal greats and it's like she just stands up again and <laughs> i mean they can't they can't figure out if this character is superhuman or if it's just like a gritty spy thriller yeah and it feels to me like an identity problem that marvel keeps having where they bloat these but these movies up to being so huge and so expensive that even what supposedly is a spy thriller supposedly like a grounded character driven action movie is eventually gonna d- devalue itself into just like this big bombastic action movie and this does that a lot there's yeah. a lot of action here and a lot of it just feels empty and kind of like, oh, here's an action sequence to fill up the movie. I was into the character drama and into that kind of plot, but I thought almost all the action kind of fell flat for me. And it reminded me that I was watching a Marvel movie, not an actual good spy thriller. Yeah, one of the things I think I agree with you on that extent of like part of it was like it was too big budget for its own good. Like really that only to me came into play with the fact of the prison escape so much where i feel like you could do that same thing but keep it more grounded like you look at mission impossible like i could see that type of thing of like okay we're using a helicopter to break a guy out of prison and make it a prison escape but it's still um it still is believable to that at at least for as far as being a movie and then just the idea of hit the black widow red room is like a hovering thing in the sky i feel like it necessarily didn't need to be Like, that's a thing that could have been just, like, an underground bunker. And, again, you just have, like, it could be more stealth rather than action and still, like, keep keep its believability and keep its groundedness. But when you have, yeah, Black Widow just, like, falling through the sky for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet. And then she's fighting, but then also she, like, takes damage from a punch. It's, like, I don't don't understand. That's, like, one of the things with Fast and the Furious. It's, like, it's always at the level of them falling mm-hmm. through the sky. With the it's never, like, a small hand-to-hand combat. I mean, there are hand-to-hand combat scenes, but it's never, like, 
a hand-to-hand -hand combat scene that's like believable those still are also over the top where this was like had the fast and the furious over the top falling through the sky but then also kind of the mission impossible hand-to-hand -hand combat realisticness where i feel like at times they didn't really blend yeah i think this movie would have been much better if it just stuck a little more grounded if it had like a, like you said a mission impossible style heist sequence rather than a big action sequence and they could have their big action finale to kind of end the big movie with a big battle but i think a couple of these other sequences could have been way more interesting with a bit more creativity and i think lower budgets do tend to breed to creativity they, they breed to like okay we got to use what we have and we got to kind of figure out what to do with what we can use versus these big budget movies are just sort of like oh yeah we'll then do a cgi action sequence and call it a day and it just feels like when i get to those action sequences in these movies no they're not shot any particularly interesting way they're not lit any particularly interesting way they're not like choreographed in an interesting way so i almost feel like as soon as an action sequence started in this movie i've my eyes started glazing over i started thinking about oh i gotta get home for the podcast oh i should mm. probably go refill my popcorn or mm. something like that and then i was just waiting for the characters to start talking again you know yeah oh uh, what was your thoughts on kind of the whole taskmaster situation because i i thought it was cool at first i thought it was going to be revealed to just be like a robot and to an extent it somewhat was, but I see a lot of people online are hating everything about Taskmaster, but I didn't read the comics. I don't know shit about Taskmaster. I went into the movie thinking it was going to be revealed that Rachel Weiss's character was Taskmaster. So anything to do with Taskmaster, I, I thought it, I enjoyed it. I thought it fit the story they were trying to tell. I don't really care if it didn't line up with the comics. I thought Taskmaster was kind of forgettable. I wasn't like offended about how bad it was. And I understand if you're a comic book, purist you see they all like change the character completely like it's not even the same origin or anything so i could see if your like favorite marvel villain is taskmaster and you're here to finally see taskmaster and you get a totally different character that you could be let down but for me i was just like oh it's another kind of forgettable marvel villain i appreciated the twist i was like oh it's t the villain is essentially like her her actions and her consequences and like something that she has to live with is is what she's fighting against, I guess. But they didn't seem to really do anything with that either. Yeah. So I, I ultimately feel like this movie had two villains like, when it could have just had one and it would have been a lot more interesting. Yeah, to me, I looked at Ray Winstone's character as the main villain and then Taskmaster was just like his henchman. So again, didn't really bother me. I almost still would have preferred it to just be like a droid with AI and that's how it mimicked everything. But fans still would have been mad because it's not like... Fan, I guess the Taskmaster in the comics is some like super like fun quippy villain, and to me, I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what Marvel needs is more quippy characters. So. <laughs> Look, all I know about Taskmaster is what he was in the Spider-Man video game on PS4, and then in the Adventures game on also on PS4. So, I have very little uh, knowledge of Taskmaster, yeah. but I know maybe less about him than I did before this movie, because <laughs> yeah. this movie did about nothing to make me want to go check out more Taskmaster comics. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't really care. I like Ray Winstone's character, but back to the negatives. The one thing I thought was dumb is kind of in the final scene when like they were going through his computer and he's like, "Oh, I've learned to manage the one resource uh, that there's abundance of in the world," and he's just like girls. And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> I was just like, yeah. "Like, I felt like that would have worked better with like an adjective in there of like lost girls or missing girls or unwanted yeah. girls or anything." But when he's like. I've learned to work with an asset that there or a resource that there's an abundance of in, or there's abundance of in this world. Girls. And I'm like, what? Yeah, that line got a laugh out of some people in my theater. I gave a little bit of a scoff. There's a few, like, there's some scenes in this, like, when in that prison heist scene, David Harbour gets, like, a little microchip thing, like a transponder that he's going to put in his ear to talk to the gang. And he pulls it open, and he takes it out, and he's looking at it, and then he looks up, and he's, like, right directly in front of the guards. No. And I laughed, assuming that it was like a joke, but everybody in the theater just was like very invested in this drama. So I, I felt uncomfortable in that moment. There were a couple of moments where I laughed and I was like, oh, maybe this isn't supposed to be funny. And that, that line of the girls was definitely one of them. He's like, I have used the most abundant resource in the world, girls. And I was like, Pff. and then people around me were just like, he's laughing at the drama scenes. My ex are written weirdly. <laughs> I was like, am I, is, yeah, I was in the same thing. I was like, I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I understand like the whole allegory and kind of like the Harvey Weinstein ness of it all. Like, I mm -hmm. get what they were going for. I just felt like it could have been done. 
better. I feel that about most of this movie, honestly, Joe. I got what they were going for. They were trying to go for the spy thriller thing, but it didn't really work for me. <laughs> and moments I liked, but yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. All of the family stuff I liked, like you said, all of the family stuff I liked, and I liked a lot of the stuff. I basically liked every scene that David Harbour was in. Yeah. But there was a lot I, of I hope you get more of that. But a lot of it, I was just like, I don't know what's going on. Like, I know what's going on, but why is it going on? <laughs> there was a little bit of I don't understand what's happening. There was I feel like is it there's parts of this movie where I thought that I missed something or was there like a movie before this that I didn't see because <laughs> there's like yeah. a lot to explain. Yeah, I'll... and a lot of it I feel like is just because it's out of time and I'm trying to remember what was going on in the yeah. world of the MCU at this point. But yeah, there's a lot to yeah. pick up on. Any, I feel like anytime I rewatch this movie, I'm directly like or doing like a Marvel. Not that I've ever done. I might do a Marvel rewatch like after I finish my Star Wars rewatch. But like, I'm definitely watching this movie right before Infinity War. Like, there's no way I'm watching this movie like two movies after Endgame. Like, that doesn't. It's, <laughs> it's just like there was no po- outside of the post credit scene with like Florence Pugh. There was no reason. There was nothing that made me be like, oh, this is why they had this come out mm-hmm. after Endgame. Like, I thought maybe there'd be something that would, like, tie into something afterward or, like, anything. Like, I think if almost, like, just to be different, I think it would have been interesting if the more framing device for this movie was, like, the whole idea of, like, oh, like, when you die, your life flashes before your eyes. If we open this movie with Natasha, like, falling feet from the ground you know at during infinity Mm -hmm. you're in endgame or infinity war whichever one it was endgame uh where she's falling to her death and like she's feet from the ground and like that's where you open and the whole movie is like the framing device of her life flashing before her eyes and that's kind of it and then the movie ends with her laying like dead on the ground I think that would have been great. Any any level of framing would have been good because I, I was thinking, oh, there's got to be a reason for them to have releases so weirdly. Maybe they have a scroll in the plot and it's kind of this backdoor set up for a scroll invasion type thing. Yeah. Maybe there's some other, any kind of reason at all for this to be where it is. And it turns out that there really wasn't. And I do theorize that this movie was probably even like halfway done and written, not done, but halfway written by the time we got to Civil War and then they ended up kind of scrapping it and Maybe they yeah. maybe they were thinking, oh, we don't want to push a female lead right now. We don't want to do this or that right now. But this yeah. feels just like it was pulled out of, you know, 2017 or whatever it was and put to 2021 with no real regard for yeah. the this franchise around it. And it kind of devalues for me a little yeah. bit this idea of, oh, it's a TV show. Everything connects. Everything is important. You can watch it all in order and it's all going to be good. And this is like you could delete this and it doesn't change anything yeah i mean maybe we'll change a different tune you know five six movies from now when we kind of see how this plays in and it's like oh okay i can see why it was released when it was released but right now i just don't understand what the point of this movie was i enjoyed watching it but as far as being a part of the larger mcu i was i was i I don't understand fully what, what what we're doing here yeah that's a that's a big problem for me is these movies don't feel like they can stand by themselves. I didn't get a good spy thriller. I didn't get a good action movie. I didn't get much out of this. I got an all right family drama wrapped around a pretty mediocre action movie and it's shoved into the Marvel universe. And <laughs> I don't know, it's, this is much more of a disappointment than I wanted it to be. I thought a return to, a return to the theaters of Marvel is going to be kind of like a nice fun romp, you know, and it's going to have a couple of flaws here and there, but I'm going to have a good time with it. And, the more I've thought about it, the more it's kind of dropped and dropped and dropped. And you mentioned upper middle. I would probably put it in the lower parts right. of my Marvel ranking. All right. So I do have my Marvel rankings on um, whatever that app is called. Letterboxd. Letterboxd. You can follow our movie changeup account on Letterboxd. We oh, don't we have one? That much, That's cool. But... Yeah, I'm going on my Letterboxd right now to look at my list of uh, MCU where I have them ranked. And I'm going to tell you where it is this of the 23 films um okay maybe i was wrong i would of the 23 i would probably put it because i would change this order looking at it now <laughs> um but those would all kind of swap around it's uh, one of those franchises where you watch it again and you look back and you think maybe this okay one's so on, on that one i'm 
it would be in around the 14th or 15th place. So I guess that is the lower middle, not upper middle. Yeah, I just think there's a lot more memorable stuff in the MCU outside of this. And even some of the weaker stuff, like I didn't think Captain Marvel was particularly great, but I no. didn't think the Skrull stuff was memorable. I think the Samuel L. Jackson and Clark Gregg de-aging was interesting. And this felt like there was practically nothing. Florence Pugh is going to stick out. We're going to do something we'll remember. Like whenever we talk about Black Widow in five, ten years, we're going to be like, oh, yeah, that Florence Pugh was good in that one. That's pretty much all we're going to yeah. talk about. We'll be like, oh, Florence Pugh is good. Taskmaster, not that good. <laughs> That's all we're going to remember about this one. And Scarlett Johansson was there. Like, even right now, I'm like, seeing it today, I'm like, what's a great Scarlett Johansson, like, moment in this movie? And it was just all constantly, like, okay. And, like, Scarlett Johansson's a good actress. It's not really her. I'm not like, oh, like, she fucked it up. It's just like they almost didn't give her a moment to, like, do anything great. Like, the only thing I can remember is her, like, intentionally breaking her nose to sever her, like, the nerve so she didn't smell Ray Winstone's pheromones so she could <laughs> punch him in the face. And, like, the as I say that out loud, I'm like, they wrote this down to put in the movie. So that, I, I forgot to mention the pheromones part. That was a good... I don't know like, about Like, it good. was not a moment the movie really needed. She should have just been able to punch him from the beginning and it would have been fine. I well, during that scene when he mentioned, "Oh, you can't punch me because you smell my pheromones." Like, someone in the back of my theater out loud was like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, and oh. that I think that sums it up. I was like, "Oh, pheromones!" And then I do want to say they they showed the bond scene earlier, so I was giving it a bit of a credit. So I'm like, "Oh, they're probably trying to put our minds in like, oh, it's the tone of a Bond movie, so like the villain's gonna be ridiculous and." It's going to be kind of ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know. I, I get a little bit like, of credit Ray, there. I didn't think Ray Winstone's character was, like, all that ridiculous, though, outside of, like, you can't punch me because of pheromones. Like, outside of that, he's he sure, he had a flying fucking lair, but, like, his personality and everything, I feel like I could go to Russia and meet a guy just like him right now. Like, he didn't seem that crazy uh, to me anyways. But, yeah, uh, I, I don't know why she couldn't just punch him from the beginning but because the scene was literally she tries to punch him and then he's like oh yeah you can't punch me because of my pheromones immediately cut to Rachel Weiss being like yeah you're not going to be able to punch him from his <laughs> pheromones and then she's basically like oh yeah I knew about that but you don't hit as hard as I thought you could uh, and I thought you'd sever the nerve and so I'm just going to do it myself and then she slams her head against the table severs the nerve and then punches him like we could have just cut out that whole five minutes and just had her punch him yeah there was a lot of wasted time in the middle of this movie i feel like that whole sequence where it's like oh we're gonna do a heist and then we're gonna stop for a second and explain the plan for a couple of seconds and go back again and start doing it again and stop explain the plan for a couple of seconds and i'm like couldn't okay just show them doing it like mm -hmm. you're not to explain to me that they yeah. plan this out like i'm gonna figure it out as they're going and doing their plan this isn't oceans 11 they don't kind of show me the whole plan at detail for detail yeah it's like the whole writing thing. If there's like a heist or some kind of operation and they don't tell you the plan, like when they plan it, then just know that it's going to go according to plan because you just get to watch it unfold. And then they say, if you see them plan it and they go step by step of what the plan's going to be, then you know it's going to go to shit because that way you know what the plan is. And so when it goes to shit, you know what the deviation is. So then when everything basically goes according to plan and they explain it, you're essentially watching the plan twice and it's boring. Yep. I think, that, yeah, like you said, if you're, if you're seeing them execute the plan, I don't need to see them explain it to me also. Yeah. Like it would be a lot more satisfying to just see them do something badass yeah. and you're like, Oh cool. They had it planned out the whole time. I thought it was a good reveal. Like that you had the mask on the whole time that the black widow you saw in the prison next to you wasn't actually the black widow at all and it was a good reveal i just wish they didn't act mm -hmm. treat the audience like we're a bunch of well i guess half of us are probably toddlers in the in marvel screenings but <laughs> come on kids could kids can figure things out yeah. kids aren't that dumb yeah and i will say as far as like you were talking about your audience being vocal the only time my audience was really making much noise uh was the scene with the pig and there there are some freaked out people that think they were about to watch a pig die from uh, <laughs> asphyxiation so. Yeah, my audience is not in the in the MCU level energy. Of course, I did see it a few days late. It's, it's now not Thursday at 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. like those hype screenings are. But yeah, I was kind of surprised at my audience. They giggled at some of the jokes, but it wasn't like, oh, there's Black Widow. And the, they, they, they clapped a bit for the credits, but it wasn't like a big 
high energy stream. Oh, my, people in Georgia, we don't clap for credits around here. We movies over. All right, let's just. We had to watch 800 trailers because I don't know where, how it's like in Chicago and Michigan. I know you get three, maybe four trailers before the movie starts. In Georgia, you're getting like eight or nine trailers before <laughs> the movie starts. So by the time the movie starts, you're already like, all right, let's let's wrap this up. Let's get this up. I've been here too, guys. I've been sitting in. I've been watching shit for a half hour. Movie was supposed to start for 10 thir- at 10.30. It's 11 o'clock, and the opening logos are just starting now. So. <laughs> Let's get to it, basically, is how it is in Georgia. So when that movie's over, you're finally just like, ugh, instead of, like, in a clapping mood. Yeah, I, I felt that a little bit for this movie. I was like, oh, God, it's actually over. Yeah. <laughs> not not nearly. It wasn't that bad, but it was a little bit just like, okay, this was bland and forgettable more so than bad. Yeah. You know, now This movie was, like, 2.15. I want to know what happened to the hour 50 movie. Like, wasn't it Jungle <laughs> Cruise or something that's coming up that's, like, two hours and, like, 30 minutes long? And we were like, why? This could have been a really nice, nice like tight, ninety minute, hundred minute movie, you know. Yeah. Get, get... I'll, I'll give it a little. Like uh, to me, hour, hour fifty, you know, you know, somewhere in there, you know. I don't know how many minutes that is, but <laughs> sixty. I don't know. One hundred and twenty is two hours, so you know you get oh, over two hours, you gotta earn it. One hundred and ten minutes. One hundred and ten minutes, you know, somewhere in there. I also pulled my, my MCU ranking up, by the way, to see where I'd put this, and I really do have to revisit mine because I have some stuff towards the bottom that I would move up and some stuff towards yeah. the top where I'm like, oh, God. Yeah, just I know it's a little off topic, but I found it. What what would you guess Jungle Cruise, the uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Emily Blunt movie runtime is? Uh, it's got to be like 2.35, right? 2.38. That Ooh, movie God. is two hours. There's no goddamn reason that movie should be. That's a movie that's an hour longer than it needs to be. I watched the trailer for that before my Black uh, Widow screening, yeah, and too. I was remarkably disappointed. I was like, oh, we've got Dwayne the Rock Johnson, we've got Emily Blunt. Like, they'll be able to hold the lead, you know, and it does not look very entertaining. It looks like two different movies. It's like we- a weird kind of somewhat realistic adventure movie, but then also it has a whole lot of Pirates of the Caribbean vibes as well with some of the mysticism, and it just looks like two movies in one, and I get that now that I know it's two hours and 38 fucking minutes long. God damn. Yeah, they're doing some like big sci-fi epic version of Jungle Cruise, the ride at Disneyland. Yeah, doesn't need to happen. <laughs> but back to... Fun the... ride, though. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever ridden it, but... Uh, back to Black Widow. Any anything you want to add or any any thoughts? It was a decent watch. I'm definitely very excited for the future of the MCU. This doesn't do enough to deter me. You know, I these shows really did kind of revitalize my MCU joy. So I was a bit more into this than I thought I was going to be going in. Even even though it let me down, I'm still looking forward to what's next. I think Shang Chi looks really interesting. I think as Marvel gets more and more cosmic and kind of beyond, I think it'll be an opportunity for them to do some creative stuff whether it's in eternals whether it's in this whether it's in all the way in the marvels a few years from now we've got a lot of reach for these characters so mm. one misstep i hope isn't enough to kind of make them go all cosmic though and not do any of these spy thriller type movies because i mm. still want them to do like a fucking the winter soldier captain america 4 type yeah. kind of stuff yeah yeah i'm kind of in the same spot and as far as like a recommendation level i would say yeah if you're an mcu fan you should definitely watch this movie but you know if you're not If you've seen a number of the MCU fans and you're like, yeah, this isn't really for me. I don't like this style. I'm not going to be sit here pounding the desk being like, I don't care if you don't like the other MCU movies. You need to watch this one. Like, you're probably not going to like this one either. Yeah, this is not Winter Soldier where it goes something or Black Panther even where it's like, okay, you might not be into the MCU, but you can get something out of this. And I think unless you're a completionist, I don't think you're going to get a lot out of this because it doesn't do much for spy thriller fans. It doesn't do much for action fans. So unless you're just trying to get some Marvel fill marvel fix as you're waiting for the rest of these movies i don't think it's much of a yeah watch maybe free on disney plus but yeah i wouldn't have to pay 30 bucks for this yeah uh, or any movie taste movie ticket price really i will say i'm uh looking forward to shang chi that trailer looks sick uh can't wait to see uh wong versus abominations should be fun to watch um Anything else you want to say before we end this and wrap this no, up? No, we just covered our uh, Disney Plus episode today, too. Yeah. So if you're watching Loki, you can watch our show on there. Yeah. Uh, we've been covering weekly every episode of Loki. The finale is coming up next week, so I'm excited to do that. And looking forward to doing spoiler reviews, hopefully, of a lot more movies now that we're finally getting back to theater and finally having movies open up. 
So it'll be fun to do stuff with Lee and you and maybe Bobby and Johnny at some point too as we get more and more movies this year. For sure, for sure. And uh, we started doing clips too. So if you're like, I don't really care about anything on Disney Plus. I just care about Bad Batch or I just care about Loki. Uh, we've clipped those out and those are currently on our YouTube channel. So watch those. And uh, we try to more go in the direction for our Disney Plus weekly review for the casual fan, you know. So if you're like, you know, I have Disney Plus. I've watched a few shows I grew up on. I don't really know what else to watch on there. Uh, watch our show we were gonna give some recommendations and we're gonna try to watch uh, at least the first few episodes of shows as they come out and say whether we think you should watch them or whether we think it's kind of a pass and i will say this week there was something that was put on there that we were basically both like don't waste your time and there's another thing that we're like eh, you know if you've got kids check it out and then we've kind of said there's some other things yeah check this out it was pretty good so uh, check out our Disney Plus review, and we should have a match this week. Uh, me versus Tristan in movies based on TV shows. Uh, we don't have a date set for that yet, but it should be coming out this week. Outside of that, uh, I think this wraps up our spoiler review of Black Widow. Uh, have a nice night and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Adios.